Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for showing up. So my name is Pravesh Kothari. I work in theoretical computer science. So I'm here in Avi's group. So I've been at the university and the institute for the past two years. And today, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, you know, a direction of research that has been particularly fruitful for me in this past two years. Uh, and that has been about a general method to design algorithms for certain statistical estimation problems. Okay? So I'll explain what this means. But you know, before giving you some general framework to think about statistical estimation problems, I want you, you know, uh, to see a simple example. Okay? And that would be somehow uh, intuitive enough to follow for the rest of the talk. So the example I want to discuss is robust estimation of a simple parameter of a distribution, just the mean. Okay? So this is, of course, a part of you know, <laughs> uh, this whole uh, the set of problems which you know, try to estimate various simple parameters of probability distributions. I'm going to stick to the most simplest, ex like simplest example, and also in just one dimension. Even though you know these problems have appropriate generalizations in higher dimensions, and to other parameters like covariance and higher moments and so on. Okay, so uh, part of what I'm going to say at a very high level is based on uh, joint work with uh, David Steuer, who was a member for a year here, uh, one year ago. Okay, so what is this problem? So let's say that you have an unknown distribution, probability distribution D, and it's over the reals. Okay? And let's assume that the variance of this distribution is bounded. So let's say variance of D is at most some sigma square. Okay? Now let's maybe start with some really toy example. Let's say that you see you know, IID samples, n of them, drawn from the distribution D. Okay? And I ask you the very simple question. Can you estimate the mean of the distribution D by looking at the samples? Okay? Now, of course, this is very easy. We know that if I just average the sample or take the so-called empirical mean, then I know that this empirical mean converges to the true mean. right? And in fact, I can also give you rates. Like For example, if n is larger than some 100 times sigma square or epsilon square, then I know that with 99% probability over the draw of the IID sample, my estimate of the mean, you know, using this empirical mean as the estimator, is going to be epsilon additively accurate, right? Great, but that's not the problem I want to tell you about today. I just there's a tiny twist on this simple problem. So you don't actually get to see this IID sample x, okay? Instead, this sample, once it is drawn, goes to a malicious adversary. Okay? <laughs> and the adversary you know, looks at the sample and tries to make your job as hard as possible. So what they're going to do is, you know. Is this where we change from statistics to computers? <laughs> 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 it's, it's a good question. But you know, this particular question was actually first thought of by statisticians. In fact, here. So Peter Huber and John Kewkey, they were both statisticians here at Princeton maybe about 50 years ago. And they started thinking about these questions. We are going to think of algorithmic versions. That's where computer science creeps in. <laughs> okay, so you know, let's say that you have an IID sample X, but now it goes to an adversary, and the adversary, you know, have has a control to change any arbitrary epsilon fraction of the samples and replace them by whatever they want. Okay? So in effect, what you get to see is an adversarial corruption Y of the samples. Okay, and the only guarantee you have about this Y is that yi equals xi for 1 minus epsilon n indices i. Okay, that's all you know. Okay? And your goal is still to estimate the mean of the distribution d. Now, of course, you know, if you try to do the same trick that we know works in the basic case, then we are going to fail miserably. Because if, if the adversary even has control of one sample, they can push you as far away from the mean as they want. Right? So we can't quite do empirical mean estimation. So there is some, at least some basic non-triviality uh, involved in this problem. So this is what I want to think of as an example of statistical estimation problems. Okay, great. So you know this is somehow you know so you know you can generalize the theme of this problem, the basic framework of this problem, and now you know cover many many problems that people have looked at. Okay. So here is here is how I think of the general framework where this problem lies in. There is some unknown parameter theta. 
you know, this need not be a single real parameter, like mean is the parameter we care about here, mu, but you know, this could be a high dimensional thing. Let's say there are p different parameters I want to estimate, right? But I don't get to see theta directly. You know, theta somehow indexes into a probability distribution p theta. Okay, so here the distribution, you know, corresponds to this process of taking some distribution with that mean and then corrupting epsilon fraction of the samples. Okay, this abstract process I'm calling as indexing into some distribution p theta, and I imagine that I get iid samples from this p theta. So let's call them y1 through yn. Right, and my goal is to invert this generation process. Okay, so I want to somehow look at the samples and go back and estimate theta. This is what I call estimation. Okay. Now, you know, um, I just want to you know, name drop a little bit so that uh, if you've seen one of these problems, you would recall immediately that this is of the same theme. This is not important for what follows in the rest of my talk. So examples of such problems include mixtures of Gaussians, like separating mixtures of Gaussians, if you heard about that. Compressive sensing, if you heard about this problem uh, in signal processing. There's a non-commutative analog of that called as matrix completion and matrix sensing, which also corresponds to this problem. But not just signal processing, such problems arise you know, in, in computational complexity, for example, uh, finding an added click to an elder Shani random graph, so it's called the planted click problem. Solving random constraint satisfaction, random three sat instances, that also corresponds to this kind of a problem in an appropriate setting. Anyway, there are many, many examples of problems which basically look like this. There is an encoding through a distribution of a certain hidden parameter. You want to look at the samples and go back and estimate this parameter. Okay, so this is the problem of, a, of my interest today. Okay, now. I want to explain to you a, an approach that we somehow have now developed for solving these problems. Right? To describe that approach, I wanted to tell you first how people usually think about these questions. And then I, I'll tell you how you can somehow modify this and make a general approach that actually gives efficient algorithms. Okay? So here's the general methodology. You think of these problems in two steps. Your goal, of course, is to design efficient algorithms. But you, you know, break it down into two steps. The first step you call establishing identifiability. So what does this mean? You know, before even asking for an efficient algorithm, we should ask ourselves, in the data that we actually see, is there enough information to recover the hidden parameter that we care about? Right? Efficient algorithm comes later. If there is no information, if there is not enough information in the data I looked at, this is going to be impossible. Right? So identifiability establishes that the sample I see has enough information to uniquely pin down the parameter up to some tiny error that I'm willing to tolerate. Okay? So if you heard of the word sample complexity, then this step is basically trying to establish that a small sample is enough to uniquely determine the parameter we care about. It determines the sample complexity of the problem. In general, it does not give you an efficient algorithm. Okay? So, you, so I'm, I'm going to depict this you know, pictorially as you know, the data goes into this box. It only gives you an inefficient algorithm in general. And out comes the parameter we care about, an estimate of the parameters we care about. And you know the, the engine that makes this work is a proof a proof that a small sample is enough to uniquely identify the parameter we care about. OK? Now, in general, this only gives an inefficient algorithm, as I said. So you have to do a next step, which is algorithm design. Okay? And somehow, it turns out that in practice, for many, many problems, including the problems that we looked at here, the second step is more or less independent of the first one. The first one tells us that this is a good problem to look at, that we are not you know, solving a problem that is inherently impossible. But then once you've realized that, we somehow have to work from scratch by hard, you know, hard work again to get to an efficient algorithm here. That's exactly what I'm saying, yes. So that is saying that you can establish identifiability, but you don't know how to. And you're saying that this could be inherent. Yes, yes true. Yes. Of course, yes. So we are not going to solve in, like, inherently impossible problems. But whenever possible, we want to somehow have a simple method to go from here to here. Okay? And that is sort of the punchline of what, you know, what I want to tell you about, which is sort of a general method that can convert proofs of identifiability into efficient algorithms. Okay, now you know there is no free lunch, there is no magic that can actually do this. As Peter pointed out, this can be impossible in general. So what is really going on is that we are going to push the complexity of algorithm design into finding a special kind of proof of identifiability. Okay, 
So there is a certain notion, a formal notion of how simple a proof of identifiability and a proof in general is. And we are going to ask that you not just find any proof here. I'm, exp I'm going to explain this in a detail in a bit, but you, I'm going to force you to find a simple proof in a certain precise sense. And the message is that if you work hard to tie your hands behind your back and do this proof, like you find a simple proof, then as a reward, you will get an efficient algorithm for free. Okay? So, so I want to you know, elaborate on this notion of simple proof for the next maybe four minutes. So, so for that, I want to describe to you how I generally think of identifiability. So here is how you know, every identifiability proof in the world looks like. Okay? You look at you know, the samples y1 through yn that we have here, and you build a test. Okay? This test takes input a purported parameter theta, theta hat. Okay? So if somebody hands over to you, here is my estimate theta hat, this test tries to check if their claim is correct. Okay? And a proof of identifiability without loss of generality can be thought of a, a test which is correct. Okay? It's a proof of identifiability is equivalent to giving a test that can check correct parameters. Of course, you know, by itself, it does not give you any method to find theta hat that makes it accept. But it just tells you that if somebody hands over a parameter, it can, it can check efficiently for you. Right? Now, this is enough to give up identifiability because you know, the correctness proof of in a test like this gives you an infinite time algorithm. Just go over all possible theta, right? And this will test will you know, succeed only on the correct one. So if you can build with a finite small sample this test tau, then you, you, know, you have an identifiability proof. Okay? Now, it turns out that this identifiability proof actually in many cases can be written down as just checking a system of polynomial equations. So tau of theta hat actually looks like whether theta hat satisfies qi of theta hat for some real polynomials 1 through r, for some small r. Okay? So this feels like something nice going on for us, because a priori we could say, well, you know, if the test looks like this, then we can just succeed by finding a solution to the system of polynomial equations. Unfortunately, this doesn't make our lives easy, because finding a solution to a system of polynomial equations is NP-hard. So you know, the existence of a certain test like this doesn't immediately get us an algorithm. Okay? But we go back and observe that what is the proof of identifiability telling us? That any theta hat that satisfies this test okay, is going to be close to the true parameter theta. Okay? So I interpret this as saying that any theta hat that lives in a real variety must satisfy the polynomial inequality. Sorry, there is no norm here because these are reals. A real polynomial inequality. Okay? So here is now, you know, I'm, I'm going to you know, wrap up in like one minute. What you're looking, so an identifiability proof is looking for uh, proving a certain polynomial inequality that holds for all real parameters that satisfy a bunch of polynomial equations. Okay? There is a general theory of when there is a certificate that proves to you that a certain inequality like this holds on a real variety. Okay? These are called as sum of squares proofs. And they have a very rich history, starting with you know, Hilbert's 17 problem, its solution by Artin, and then extensions of this result due to uh, Stengel, Krivine, and Putinar, leading to what are called as positive Stellensart's theorems. Today, we know algorithmic analogs of them. Okay? And the idea is that whenever there is a sum of square certificate that establishes non-negativity of a polynomial like this over a real variety, which uh, you know, corresponds to our test of identifiability, then we can automatically convert it into an algorithm. Now, this is like you know, more or less an abstract setting. It does not tell us how to design algorithms. So my final punchline is this. It turns out that when we do such proofs of identifiability for problems like the one I showed you, we actually tend to use just this simple sequence of inequalities. Inequalities like Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, or Hölder's inequality, or you know, slightly more complicated analytical analogs like hypercontractivity theorem, or various isoparametric inequalities. It turns out that all of these are, can be phrased as polynomial inequalities over real varieties. And all of them have simple certificates in the sense of sum of squares proofs. So what this actually tells us that if we somehow just do a proof that uses a composition of these inequalities, then we get simplicity for free, which means by just relying on this one engine, the algorithmic engine that finds positive Salenzar certificates, we get algorithm for all such problems. Okay? Now it turns out that usually, at least <laughs> in computer science, our proofs more often than not look like a composition of these simple inequalities. 
So it turns out that by just looking at the proof that we did and going back and checking that, oh, I just use the simple inequalities which are known to be have, have simple sum of square certificates, I get an algorithm for free. Okay, so this methodology we have used successfully to you know solve problems like mean estimation that I already showed you in the robust setting, but also analogs of this, including the problems I mentioned before, like compressive sensing or uh, you know separating measures of Gaussians. So 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 the message is that somehow you know implicitly we were already designing algorithms when we were showing that these problems are information theoretically soluble, and we just go back and realized it. Okay, that's uh, that's all. <coughs>